In October 2006, five Amish school children in Pennsylvania were massacred by a man who then turned the gun on himself. And America looked on with astonishment as almost the first response of the community was to forgive the man and his family. It seems there is plenty of company to be found in our hurt and our anger, but we're often alone on the pathway that leads to forgiveness. We want to keep the offense alive, and we believe the lie that it's our responsibility to do so until justice is served. People begin to rationalize their attitude and behavior towards unforgiveness, thinking things like, after what he did to me, forgive him, no way. Or after what she said, you don't understand, I'll never forgive her. Well, a simple definition of forgive is to let go. For example, if I offered you a balloon and a marker, and I suggested you write the name of the person who would hurt you on that balloon, and then begin to ride all over that balloon the things you need to forgive that person for, how big of a balloon would you need? I've had more than one person tell me they'd need a hot air balloon for that exercise. Well, another simple definition or illustration of forgiveness is to cancel a debt to take an account of everything that you feel owed and mark it canceled and just to let that go as well. Romans 13.8 says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continual debt to love one another. But how am I going to let that go? Let's look at a few things that forgiveness is not. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the popular adage, forgive and forget, but it is actually abnormal and undesirable to forget. In fact, I say you need to remember in order to forgive. The first childhood memory for many is something traumatic that's happened either to them or to somebody else. And legitimately, there could be some amnesic condition that keeps you from remembering that trauma. But often we do remember those things that have hurt us the most. Forgiving doesn't change our history, our humanity, or our memories because bad things have really happened to us. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, keep no record of wrongs. Forgiven is not forgetting, is actually choosing not to remember. When our son was younger, and as children will do, there are occasionally things that happen that we need to forgive him for. And after we resolved that, we would sit him down and say, son, we're gonna choose not to remember this. We forgive you for what you've done. That means we're not gonna tell about this at the family reunion. This isn't gonna be used as an illustration in one of dad's talks. We're not going to remind you of this the next time that something happens. We're going to choose now to forgive you and not remember this and move on. Another thing that forgiveness is not, forgiveness and grieving are not the same. Sometimes the hurt is so deep that we need to have permission to grieve and have a process of grieving in order to work through the hurt that has come to us. Forgiveness and trust are not the same thing. Just because I forgive a person doesn't mean it may be appropriate or necessary or even possible to trust them again. Forgiveness and restoration are not the same thing. When my nephew was creamed in an intersection because someone failed to stop, that didn't immediately restore his car just because he was willing to forgive the person. In fact, it was quite a lengthy process over several months before his car was back on the road. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. Reconciliation implies that there are two parties who are in agreement. And reconciliation may not be possible. It may not even be appropriate. For example, if a person is deceased, it will not be possible to reconcile with that person. Another thing that forgiveness is not, forgiveness and approval are not the same thing. In John chapter 8, when the woman was caught in adultery, Jesus didn't side with her. He didn't condone or approve of what she had done. He simply said, don't do this again. Forgiveness and consequence are not the same thing. Just because we forgive doesn't mean there aren't going to be consequences because of what happened. I think of the story of David and Bathsheba. There was the exposure and the shame. There was the death of the child they had born out of wedlock. There was rebellion in his family. There was generational adultery and all kinds of woes. There were consequences because of their behavior. Finally, forgiveness and punishment are not the same. It is not my responsibility to keep an offense alive until justice is served, but it is my responsibility to forgive the person who has offended me. Unforgiveness is rooted in offense. So a simple definition of offense is a stumbling block 
something that you trip over repeatedly. But interestingly, another definition of offense is a cause or an occasion of sin. Hebrews chapter 12, 15 says, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Telling others about the offense is one way you bind them to it unnaturally and a way that you keep that poisonous root alive and growing. We had a Bradford pear, a large Bradford pear in our front yard that we had removed two years ago. And two years later, even though we had ground the stump and covered it with dirt and put seed in that spot, shoots still appear in the yard where that tree used to be. And the reason is down below there, there's still some life in those roots. In a similar way, as long as there's a root of bitterness that is alive, things are going to shoot to the surface to remind us of or cause us to act on that offense. Well, when offense does take root and bears fruit, things can grow rotten very, very quickly. I think of the account of Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth when he revealed who he was and people took offense at that. And in effect, they were saying, who does he think he is? Isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? And they became so angry about this they determined to throw him over the cliff. Ultimately, Jesus did suffer indescribable cruelty leading up to and during his crucifixion on the cross. But even there, we can look to his response, which becomes our example. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, it records that as he looked down on those who had so horribly abused him and falsely accused him, he had the grace and the mercy to say, Father, forgive them they don't know what they're doing. Forgiveness is at the core of who God is and what He has done for us in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness links us to a supernatural act of intervention to set things right. Forgiveness requires both your will, that is your willingness to forgive, linked to God's power. For more information or to order a copy of The Language of Forgiveness, visit www oikosnetwork.com or continue with the language of forgiveness part two.